Hey guys and welcome back for another episode of my mystery series where today I want to share with you the story of a girl called Elsie Frost. Elsie was murdered back in October 1965 but thanks to some poor police investigation and some missed opportunities, as always seems to be the case, her case quickly went cold. However, after years and years of relentless campaigning from Elsie's siblings, Colin Frost and Anne Cleave, the West Yorkshire Police reopened the case in 2015, which finally led to some answers. I wish I could tell you this case was officially solved, but it does come to a rather frustrating conclusion in the end. Whilst we do like to know the perpetrator in this case, and there was an arrest finally after over 50 years, no justice has ever been brought. I questioned whether this was a case I wanted to share on my channel because we all know that I don't often like to cover solved cases, even if they're only technically solved. But what really strikes me with Elsie's story is how her family refused to ever give up on her. Over 50 years later and they were still fighting for their sister and their efforts paid off in the end. If not for Anne and Colin, we might never have had answers as to what happened to Elsie. And I think that's a wonderful motivation for all of us to remember, that it's never too late to get answers. It's never too late to start the fight. There's always a chance of a case being solved and there's always hope. As I often do, I want to start today by giving a quick shout out to my main source for this episode, which is a podcast called Who Killed Elsie Frost by BBC Radio 4's IPM. This podcast is a few years old now, it's from 2015 before the case was reopened, before any inquests, so it's not entirely up to date but it does do a really good job of laying out all the details of this case and also just sharing who Elsie was. It features interviews with Elsie's siblings and it's just a really good look into the case overall. I would highly recommend to listen if you want to learn more after finishing this video. As Anne says in the podcast, the important thing to their family has never been so much trying to find out who committed this crime, it's more why, why Elsie, why commit such a terrible crime? And that's where the information that we have right now fails to provide any closure. Sadly, there probably isn't a reason why other than just horrific violence and a complete disregard for human life. Elsie Frost was born on the 7th of February 1951 in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, here in the UK to her parents Arthur and Edith Frost. According to Anne, they all had a very good childhood and were a close-knit family growing up. They had regularly gone on picnics and go on these caravan holidays. Elsie was a very bright girl. She was incredibly intelligent and was on track to becoming head girl at school and she knew it. And she was a model student who just loved to read. She had this really bright future ahead of her and probably would have been able to go on to do great things with her life. She was also undeniably a really beautiful girl. She had this striking face and she had plenty of friends. She was kind and fun and she'd recently joined the local youth club to make more friends. Shortly after lunch, on Saturday the 9th of October 1965, 14-year-old Elsie said goodbye to her dad Arthur to head to the local lake or local lagoon for the day. She was to spend the afternoon with her school, Snapethorpe School Sailing Club, where she'd been asked to help teach a group of younger children how to sail. Elsie had recently taken up sailing herself and she loved it. So this was a really big day for her. She was elated that she'd been given that responsibility of teaching younger kids how to do it. And she was just generally a very happy girl at this time in her life. Like life was going really well for her, as well as life could ever go for a 14 year old girl. When she left her home in Wakefield, she was wearing a yellow wool sweater, a white blouse and a printed cotton skirt, as well as a brand new pair of shoes. Over the top she wore her favourite red quilted anorak coat that her aunt had bought her, and she was carrying her sailing clothes in a duffel bag over her shoulder. Elsie and her friends left the sailing club at some point between 3.50 and 4pm it seems, but Elsie ended up walking a different route home from her friends. She was wearing her brand new shoes and didn't want to get them muddy, so decided to walk down the canal towpath towards home instead of walking through a partially flooded tunnel with her friends, who were all wearing much more suitable wellies. As she walked home, her killer attacked her as she walked through a tunnel underneath a railway line. And the attack was brutal. She was stabbed five times. Twice in the head, once in the hand, which is a defensive wound, and twice in the back. One of these wounds pierced her heart, which ultimately led to her death. Elsie's later post-mortem would show that she had died of shock and hemorrhage due to multiple stab wounds. After the attack, she managed to make it through the tunnel and ended up collapsing at the bottom of the steps leading to the top of the bridge. 
These steps are known by the local Wakefield kids as the ABC steps, as there are exactly 26 of them. She was soon found at the bottom of the steps by a local man called Thomas Brown, who was out on a dog walk with his two young children. As Elsie was lying face down at the base of the steps, he assumed that she had fallen down the stairs and was crying. He went to ask if she was okay, but as he got closer, he realised that she was dead. Within minutes, others had appeared on the scene, including one of the sailing instructors from the lagoon, and they waited with Elsie whilst Thomas ran to call an ambulance and the police. Officers soon turn up at the Frost front door to let them know the sad news, and in that moment, their lives changed forever. Arthur, Elsie's dad, had to be the one to go and identify her body, and Colin and Anne would say in the podcast that the father was simply never the same from that moment. Anne, being older and married, living a few miles away, says that when somebody came to her door to tell her what happened, she essentially blacked out. She has very fuzzy memories of the moments after she received the news, and she just didn't believe it at first. Colin, who was younger, at just six years old, said that he was sent to other family members' houses to be looked after, and he wouldn't see his parents for a couple of weeks. Very quickly, the media caught on to what happened to Elsie, and her murder dominated the headlines over coming days. Such brutal murders like this of young girls just wasn't something that happened all that often. I mean, it still isn't. It was a shock to everyone in the local community, but also everyone in the country. Colin says that he was at his uncle's house on a Monday night when they were watching the news and Elsie's face pops up, at which point his uncle quickly picks him up and takes him out of the room. He doesn't remember anything after that point, but it's probably then when he realised that his sister wasn't coming home. Anne would say that journalists tracked down where she was living and they hounded her relentlessly, whilst her parents were staying with her just trying to come to terms with what had happened. She says that had she not been assigned a police officer to stay with her in this time and help her out with this kind of thing, she would have been completely out of her depth. Being hounded by the media so soon after something like this happening is something I can't even imagine, trying to come to terms with life as it is now and having to answer to journalists. But also, you need the media in cases like this. You need word to spread so people can come forward with information they have. It's a double-edged sword. Luckily, just like the media coverage, the police investigation here was also huge, at least in the weeks immediately after. 400 people who lived within a quarter of a mile of the murder were traced and their movements were checked. Police went round asking people to hand their knives over to be examined, but it's not thought they ever found the murder weapon. Many young men and teenage boys at this point carried sheath knives on their persons at all times. These small bladed knives that were not carried with the intention of being weapons, but just because they were useful for whittling wood, opening parcels, for any number of DIY jobs. That meant there were a lot of knives for police to look at, but no luck came of this search. Alongside this, over 12,000 men were questioned, but everything came to a dead end despite it being the biggest manhunt Wakefield had ever seen, and the army eventually got involved with mine detectors, or these intense metal detectors, to try and uncover the murder weapon. They also held recreations of that afternoon to try and trace Elsie's footsteps, and they appealed for a teenage train spotter to come forward who had been seen near the scene. Not because this teenager was a suspect, but because he'd been taking photos and maybe he'd caught the perpetrator on film. This boy was eventually found, he handed over his camera, and there was nothing useful on there. Ultimately, investigators were never able to establish any motive for Elsie's murder, which made hunting down the perpetrator that much more complicated. They didn't know if Elsie had been the intended victim, if the one responsible had earmarked her as a victim and was following her, or if she just happened to come across his path. They could find no one who had even the slightest animosity against Elsie or anyone in her family. There was also no sign that she had been sexually assaulted or robbed. It was just sheer horrific violence for the sake of it. Or had the killer been interrupted before he could continue with his crime? We don't know now and the police didn't know at the time. It is a lot easier to look for a criminal if you know you're looking for a paedophile or somebody with a history of sexual assault or if you're looking for an item that had been taken, but the police here had nothing. As the investigation continued, an inquest was opened two months later in January 1966. There were 40 witnesses who spoke at this inquest in front of a jury, including a young boy who cast suspicion on a man called Ian Bernard Spencer. This boy said he'd seen Ian Spencer near the scene of the murder, 
and this was apparently enough to make this man suspicious. Spencer was 33 years old, a railway fireman, and he was married with a son. Spencer was pulled in front of the inquest himself and said that he had been near the lake the day that Elsie had died, but he'd returned home to his wife by 3.30pm and the crime would have taken place after this. He said that when he heard of Elsie's murder the next day, he immediately became concerned about his own knife. He said that his family had had a string of bad luck recently and it would be just the case that he would have lost his knife in this area and would have become a suspect. However, he said that he later found his knife in his clothes, it had never been lost, and he decided to share this passing thought he had at the inquest. This was enough to make him suspicious in front of the jury. At the end of the inquest, the jury deliberated for two hours and came back saying that Elsie's death had indeed been a murder, no surprise to anyone. She'd had multiple stab wounds leading to shock and hemorrhage. But they also said there was a prima facie case against Ian Spencer for being the one responsible for Elsie's murder. Funnily enough, I'd never heard of the term prima facie until fairly recently. Jodie Comer's actually doing a one-woman show in the West End titled Prima Facie. And out of curiosity, I was googling what it meant a couple of weeks ago, so this is like fresh information for me. In all of my years researching cases, it's very strange this term would come up now. But anyway, prima facie is a Latin expression which means at first sight or based on first impression. Legally, it means in kind of layman's terms that upon initial examination, there is sufficient corroborating evidence to support a case. In most legal proceedings, one party must discharge the burden of proof by citing prima facie evidence to establish its claim, if that makes sense. So in regards to this case, basically on first impressions of Ian Spencer and his story, they had enough to push forward with legal proceedings and he was arrested for Elsie's murder. So his trial began in coroner's court in mid-February 1966 and it was very quickly found that there was just no case against him and it was dropped. There was no blood found on any of his clothes and there's no evidence to suggest that he was at the scene at the time. He had an alibi at the time as he was home with his wife. Plus he had no motive, there was no reason as to why Ian Spencer would do this. However, despite being basically acquitted, he remained in jail. At this time, even if you were acquitted in coroner's court, you could still face the higher courts, the assizes. In March, his case was heard again at Leeds Assizes and he was once again found not guilty and it was at that point that he was finally allowed to walk free. There was no evidence against Ian Spencer, I think the police just wanted to find somebody guilty to close the case because after this point, that's basically where the investigation into Elsie's death came to an end and little more would happen in this case for decades. As Elsie's sister Anne points out to the Who Killed Elsie Frost podcast, if they've now found that their suspect is not guilty, shouldn't they continue to be out there looking for the person who is? And sadly, although Ian Spencer was found not guilty, there was never any evidence against him, he would live in the shadows of this accusation for the rest of his life. And he was young, he was only 33. A 2015 article on the BBC website features an interview with Ian Spencer's son, Lee, who said that for the rest of his life, his father would write down his movements in a notebook. So places he'd been, times and mileage, the moment he arrived, the moment he left, everything. He was terrified of being accused of something again, and for good reason, because he was accused again. Over the following years, whenever there was another murder, the police would turn up at the Spencer house to ask Ian where he'd been when the crimes had been committed. It was unfair and unjust. He had been found not guilty, cleared by two different courts with zero evidence against him, and yet the police would still turn up at his door. It really is heartbreaking, and Ian Spencer sadly died in 2018, but not before he got the news that he would eventually be totally exonerated, so that's something. They really clung on to Spencer as the killer it seems, but gave up searching for the actual perpetrator responsible for Elsie's death. In 1988, Edith Frost died, and in 2003, Arthur Frost died. Colin would say their family was torn apart by what happened, and of course their parents died with no idea what happened to their daughter. But Colin and Anne never gave up hope of finding out what happened to Elsie, 
and on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the crime, and contacted the BBC, which led to Radio 4 journalists investigating the case, and after they started airing the podcast, multiple listeners got in touch with new evidence and new theories. Ultimately, the pressure of this forced the West Yorkshire Police into reopening the case, the reinvestigation being carried out by the Major Investigation Review Team, assisted by newly recruited civilian investigators and retired detectives. They started their appeal for fresh information on the 2nd of October 2015, asking anyone who attended the Balney Lane Youth Club, which was a local youth club in 1965, to contact them as they didn't think that all members were spoken to at the time. They were also specifically looking to identify a man on a bike who was seen near the murder scene, but in all honesty my research didn't tell me whether this man was found in the end or not, I don't really know. West Yorkshire Police's DCI Elizabeth Belton said to the BBC that they hoped there was a possibility that the person responsible might actually come forward to clear their conscience and admit to the murder. Of course, now seven years on, we know this didn't happen, but this is something that can sometimes happen, the pressure of reinvestigation causing people to crack after decades. DCI Belton also said they were not going to be able to re-examine all the evidence from the time, because back in the 60s, there was no way to anticipate the scientific advances in this field. They didn't know that DNA evidence would become a thing, they couldn't have known that. So six months after the investigation, all of Elsie's belongings from the scene were offered to be returned to her family, and when they refused the belongings, they were destroyed, and that was that. So any potential DNA evidence in this case, or even a review of the old evidence, was impossible. Investigators are now relying on new information from the public entirely. At the same time, Colin and Anne were trying to get hold of as much information about Elsie's case as they could. They tried to get hold of the case files of this case, but they were sealed, and they still are, with the National Archives refusing to release them as they named other suspects, and if released into the public domain, it could harm any future criminal proceedings. I still don't think they've been able to get hold of these. But there was some interesting information that came out as a result of the podcast. A woman called Janice Hurst, a friend of Elsie's at the time, said that as an adult she was training as a nurse and got talking to a colleague about Elsie. The colleague said that she had been working in a hospital when a man had been brought in who confessed to Elsie's murder. He allegedly said that he was in the long grass with another man committing a homosexual act when Elsie caught them. In their panic, with homosexual activity being illegal until 1967, this man ran off after her and stabbed her. This wasn't reported at the time apparently because of patient-doctor confidentiality and also the fact the man was on very strong medication at the time. Janice said that the nurse who told her this passed away many years ago but she does still know the name of the men involved and she would be willing to speak to the police. I assume they did eventually contact her. Of course this story is word of mouth, Janice wasn't there when this alleged confession happened and legally it would be classed as double hearsay. A much deeper investigation would need to take place to find out if there was anything to this. According to the writer of this BBC article, this rumour was a very common one at the time though. Many people had heard that Elsie was killed after stumbling upon such a scene. But as with everything else here, there was no actual evidence. At least now though, with this reinvestigation, there was new information like this coming in very often, so there were steps forward happening. And then, on the 27th of September 2016, it was announced that the Thames Valley Police had arrested a 78-year-old man in connection with Elsie's death in Berkshire. And then two days after that, it was announced that he'd been released on bail. In March 2017, the same man was arrested for a second time, where he was also questioned in relation to another allegation of rape and kidnap in 1972. Police said that he was re-arrested after fresh evidence was uncovered. Towards the end of March, this man was publicly named as Peter Pickering, who had been convicted of the 1972 manslaughter of 14-year-old Shirley Boldly in Wimwell near Barnsley. It was also announced at the same time that he had died the day before in a secure psychiatric hospital. After the murder of Shirley, he had admitted to manslaughter by diminished responsibility and had been detained in psychiatric hospitals ever since, including a stint in Broadmoor. Detective Superintendent Nick Wallen said at the time of Pickering's death, 
We can now formally confirm that Peter Pickering was the man we arrested and interviewed over the last two years as part of the renewed investigation into the murder of 14-year-old schoolgirl Elsie Frost in Wakefield in 1965. We strongly suspected that Peter Pickering was responsible for her murder. We had been liaising with the Crown Prosecution Service and it was our expectation that Pickering would be charged in due course. His unexpected death clearly means that will no longer happen. Obviously, this information was a blow to Elsie's family, who would be given hope at the prospect of a new suspect. Pickering's death means that they'll likely never get the answers that they need. They'll never be able to get the answer they so want as to why, why Elsie? Just a few days before his death, Pickering had been found guilty of the 1972 rape of an 18-year-old woman just weeks before he killed Shirley Baldy. The unnamed victim said that she'd never reported the attack at the time, as she didn't think that anyone would believe her, but in 2016 the police persuaded her to cooperate and go to trial. She told the jury, I remain of the fervent belief that whether he has a mental illness or not, the man is a monster and wherever he is right now, that's the right place for him to be. Pickering was awaiting his sentencing at the time of his death, which wasn't treated as suspicious. But Pickering's death was not to be the end of the fight for Elsie's family, who were insistent on getting a new inquest. Colin said, There's a huge amount of emotion for us as a family, but the overriding one is frustration, because we were so close to getting a result, and that's been taken away from us. An inquest would allow the police to declare all the evidence they have against Pickering, and also set the record straight for Ian Spencer's family. The family's request for a new inquest was granted in December 2018, with the Attorney General stating that they were satisfied that there is new evidence available that was not put before the previous inquest, and the inquest took place in 2019. What they learned at this new inquest was difficult to hear because it turns out that Pickering was a suspect from very early on. Within just days of Elsie's murder, his name fell across the desk of the West Yorkshire Police sent to them by Scotland Yard, as he was wanted for two sexual assaults at this time. Officers were actually so suspicious of him that they put his home in Woonwell under 24-hour surveillance, but they noted that they were unable to trace him. What they didn't realise was that Pickering was entering and leaving his home right under their noses. He was just disguising himself as a woman. Police said they weren't legally allowed to actually enter his home at this time, and when he was identified, an officer crashed his car into a gatepost in an attempt to intercept him. Eventually, Pickering ended up fleeing after a car chase on the 26th of October. But then, two months later, Ian Spencer was charged with the murder and they forgot all about Pickering, even after Spencer was acquitted. I don't know if it was incompetence or just pure stubbornness that meant they didn't revisit Pickering as a suspect until the investigation was reopened in 2015. Had he been apprehended at this time, Shirley Baldy would never have died and the surviving victim wouldn't have had to endure the trauma that she did. In 2015, investigators uncovered two storage units which contained documents written by Pickering over the previous 40 years, some of which appeared to incriminate him in Elsie's murder. They also found documents that proved he was in West Yorkshire at the time of the murder, and in the days before, he had written an angry letter to his then-girlfriend, who had retracted an alibi in relation to his earlier sexual offences. Pickering was in a state of rage, and the police interpreted this letter as indicating that he intended to kill a stranger. They have all of the puzzle pieces here, except for one, and they'll likely never get it because Peter Pickering is now dead. If he was still alive, it's likely that he would have gone in front of a court and he would have been convicted of Elsie's murder, but we'll never be able to get that final piece of confirmation now. Although the head of the investigation, DCSI Wallen, has said under oath that he had no doubt that Peter Pickering murdered Elsie Frost, that's not confirmation, that's not a guilty verdict. The Frost family accepted that the inquest could not determine Pickering's guilt, but it gave them a chance to look at all of the evidence as a whole and come to their own conclusion. It was an overview of everything, and whilst we can't say there's no doubt that Pickering was the one responsible, the likelihood is that he was. The Frost family can never truly achieve closure, but they now have the closest they can get. And this is all thanks to a family who refused to give up on their sister. They managed to get answers. Maybe not the exact answer they wanted, but they got something.
The police never would have reopened this case without the public pressure to do so, which is what makes talking about cases like this so important. We see it time and time again, it's amazing what a bit of pressure can do. There's a lot of ethical implications of true crime, like believe me I'm more aware of them than anyone, but I truly believe that when it's approached in the right way, amazing things can happen off the back of sharing stories like this. I have a lot of families come to me wanting me to cover the stories of their loved ones, whether it's a case that went cold decades ago, or a missing person they haven't seen in many years that the police just don't really care about. It's because that putting things on a public platform gets the word out and it does put pressure on the authorities. Time and time again when I speak to family members, what they want is pressure. And there are a lot of ethical questions when it comes to true crime, there really are and there's a lot to be considered. But I think it is so important to share these things, to talk about these things. If Elsie's family hadn't got that podcast, they likely wouldn't have the answers that we have today. They likely wouldn't know that Peter Pickering probably was the one responsible. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.